Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Shore Community Church. It's fantastic to join with you this morning. Hope you're feeling good today. Hope you're feeling blessed. So much to celebrate, so much to reflect on as well. However you find yourself this morning, whatever kind of feelings you, you have coming into this place today, or if you're joining us online, you're welcome. And God welcomes us just as we are, exactly who we are, exactly where we are. Whatever we've been through, whatever we're going through, whatever's happening for us right now, God welcomes you today, exactly where you are and exactly who you are. Let's draw close to him today. We're blessed later on. Uh, Matt Butler from Salvation Army is uh, going to be uh, sharing the message with us. Say whoop. So there's a lot of enthusiasm there. No pressure. No pressure. This is going to be the best thing you've ever heard in your lives. No pressure. <laughs> Lock the doors. He's not allowed out. It's great to welcome Matt. Um, and it's great to welcome all of you, whether this is the first time you've been here or the 10,000th time you've been here. You're very welcome. We're going to start off by singing songs of praise and worship. If you're able to stand, please stand with me. If you'd rather sit, that's absolutely fine. There's stuff down here for the kids to do if you've got youngsters with you. Soon dissolve like snow, 
the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine will be forever mine you are forever mine open the eyes of my heart Lord to see you I want to see
Holy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are welcome here today, Lord, in our hearts. Lord, in everything that happens here in this place, Lord, fill this place, Holy Spirit. Fill our hearts, Holy Spirit. Fill our lives, Holy Spirit. We want to see you. We want to hear you. We want to know you in every word spoken, in every note sung, Lord, in, in everything that we see and hear, in every smile and cup of coffee and greeting with a friendly face, Lord. We want to know you. We want to know you better, Lord. Draw near, Lord. Draw near to us. Draw stronger and nearer in our hearts, Lord, that we may know you. You're always here. You're always close, Lord. But today, Lord, I pray that every single one of my brothers here in this place and joining us online, we will know that we have met with the living God for your glory, Lord, for our joy. Amen. I'd just like to invite Julie to come up and share some notices with us. Please do take a seat. Um, I'm Julie, I'm one of the trustees and I've just got a few notices for you this morning. The notices do get sent out in a weekly email, um, so I'm just highlighting some of those things. If you don't get that and you'd like to get that, then please ask Carla and she will add you to the list. Um, so Chris and some of his friends come from Ashley Place. We still need some more people to walk them to the church each Sunday. It's about a 15 minute walk. So if you're able to do that, if you could speak to John Lex, that would be great. Uh, Nick's induction, Saturday the 25th of March. And it would be great if a number of us could go here um, and just uh, give him our blessing really on the next stage of his journey. If there's enough, we're gonna get a coach or a minibus and if not we'll all make our own way but if you could let Carla know if you intend to go whether you'd like to go on the coach or the minibus uh, because Mark Yake needs to know numbers and they're very organized so they would like to know numbers now rather than the 24th of March um, I just want to invite Jo Murphy to come up and tell us about something while she's coming. Uh, I just want to remind you that there's a prayer meeting on a Zoom prayer meeting on Monday fortnightly. There's one this Monday. Again, the link was on the email that went out, but if you didn't get that, um, you can ask Carla and she'll tell you. So Jo's just going to tell us about um, a clothes swap that she's arranging. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I uh, just want to tell you about Clothes Swap. It's on Saturday, the 11th of February, three o'clock. Please bring, please bring three items of clothing. Mainly we're going for ladies, young, young women, uh, children. But you know, we, we'll have a rack if you gentlemen want to bring things along. So it's all inclusive. Um, we do have a colour me beautiful lady coming along. Um, she's, a, she's a consultant and she's just, it's been a fun. She's going to be doing colours, little session thing. But the tickets are £5. Um, I will be doing cash from next Sunday, but we also have church suite, which is the <coughs> ideal way to pay, but we'll have two options. Um, so as from tomorrow, you'll be able to buy tickets. All right, thank you very, very much. Have I missed anything? Um, just... What is Colour Me Beautiful? <laughs> Sorry. Colour Me Beautiful is basically a kind of, um, it's like a, it's something we've been going for 20 or 30 years. It's, it's, the, it's, it's like what colour suits your complexion and your hair and stuff like that. And, um, it's, it's quite light, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, it's not too serious. Do you think I can add anything to that, Joe? Yeah, tone of colour. Yeah, that kind of thing, yeah. Brill. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Jo. Uh, yeah, I'm sure that'd be a great time. So the link will be up on Church Suite tomorrow um, if you want to go up and book there. Um, and I just want to um, tell you about a new uh, group that we're going to be starting. It's a Kinsing Kintsugi Hope Wellbeing Group. Um, I don't know if any of you... Most of you may have heard of kintsugi, uh, which is the Japanese art of repairing pottery, where something's broken and it's put back together with a gold thread. Um, and the idea is that something broken can be made beautiful, and perhaps even more beautiful than it was before it was broken. Um, and that's the kintsugi, uh, 
the philosophy of their whole group. And they have what's called wellbeing groups, which they started up just before lockdown. Um, and these groups are a safe and supportive place that will provide tools for self-management um, in a facilitated group session. And it's, it's going to be, we're going to be looking at our emotional well-being. So a lot of us, or well, some of us, not me, might look after our physical well-being by going for a run or going to the gym or those sorts of things. Uh, some of us might look at our diet and make sure we've got a healthy diet. And emotional well-being is just something else that we should be mindful. So we look at our physical, our emotional and our spiritual well-being. We should all be looking at those things because they're intertwined. So the Kintsugi wellbeing groups are a way of looking at our emotional well-being. And it's 12 sessions. They're structured but non-judgmental. They'll include group and individual activities. And they're just designed to help us accept ourselves and work through some of the things that perhaps we find a bit more difficult. So we'll be looking at things like disappointment, loss, anxiety, anger, perfectionism, shame, resilience, all those sorts of things that perhaps we struggle on a daily basis, some of us, at, at times. We might be overwhelmed. Or it might be something that you want to come and get some tools in your toolbox to help some other people that are going through things like that. So we're starting a daytime course on the 21st of February. That's a Tuesday and it'll be two o'clock. And then after Easter, we're going to be starting an evening course. So if it's something you'd like to come to, but you, you've then got a choice of daytime or evening, and that will be on a Tuesday evening as well. And the link for that will be going up on Church Suite as well. So if you want to book into that, you can book on through Church Suite. But if you want to know anything else, just ask me or Sandy, and we'll be able to give you some more details. We had a lovely Thanksgiving service for John Lafort on Friday and there's some flowers uh, that Jenny would really like to bless people with and they're out in the foyer and you're welcome to either take some and help yourself or take some and give them away to somebody else. And just to let you know that Rosemary Heaton's Thanksgiving service will be here on the 10th of February so it's a week Friday at two o'clock. And then we're just going to take the offering, if we could have some people to take the baskets round. Um, and the baskets are one way that we can give into the church. Uh, you can give by standing order, you can give on church suite. There's a machine in the cafe uh, that you can tap if you want to. If you want to know more about giving, uh, speak to John Lex. So I'm just going to pray while they're taking the baskets round. Father, we just want to thank you for your provision, for your abundance, um, and just for supplying all our needs. And we just want to pray now over the offering and the finances of the church, and that you'd help us to be good stewards, um, that you would bless the money that's being given, a lot of it sacrificially, and we thank you for that. We just pray that uh, this would be used to multiply your kingdom in the way that you would want it. Amen. Amen. One more. Please stand with me if you're able to. Let's continue to worship. Sing one more song and then the kids and young folk are going to go out. Just use this song as a prayer, as a devotion, as we picture ourselves coming into the presence of the Lord, tuning in to that reality that He's always close. Picture yourself walking into his courtrooms. How lovely is your dwelling place O Lord Almighty My soul longs and even faints for For here my heart 
us to greet us you run towards us Lord you love us so much and I pray all my brothers and sisters here today and joining us in whatever means will just know how much they are loved Lord that you like to spend time with us as we approach you Lord you're not looking askant at us you're not looking down on us you're not looking with uh, disappointment or despair there's a big smile on your face Lord As you run with arms open wide to embrace us, Lord, to embrace us, to greet us with a kiss, as that story relates, to place that robe on our shoulder, a ring on our finger, we are welcome 
we are welcome to your home. We are welcome to your courts. We are welcome in your family. We are sons and daughters of the living God. Every single one. We are children of the living God. And Lord, we thank you for our children and young people today. We pray for them as they go out into their groups that they will have a wonderful time, Lord. They will be blessed and filled up with your presence, Lord, that they will know you and meet you through what they're doing today. And also, Lord, for those who will be caring for them, looking after them, Lord, give them energy, enthusiasm. Lord, give them a fresh vision of you today as they uh, see you in those kids and also in the lesson and the the journey, the learning that they've prepared. Bless them, Lord, in the name of Jesus. So if you have kids, if you could make sure they get out to the right place, it's primary school and, uh, and youth out the back. I think uh, little ones are around somewhere in the back as well. Have a chat with T or one of the youth leaders, the kids leaders, and they'll direct you with where to go. We're going to carry on worshipping. One with 
himself I cannot die My soul is purchased by his blood My life is hid with Christ on high With Christ my Savior and my God With Christ my Savior and my God the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless the Lord.
gates of heaven there is nothing to separate us from the love of God not height not depth not angels not devils not life not death 
Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. As the gates of heaven have been opened wide, and God's spirit is pouring out on his people. Let our hearts and our ears be open wide. I'm going to invite Matt to come and share with us now. Let's just pray for Matt as he comes out. Father, thank you for our brother Matt. Thank you for his love, his friendship. Thank you for the amazing service that he uh, and Sarah do through uh, Salvation Army in Bognor Regis. They are such a gift and a blessing amongst us. We pray that you would just bless his heart, um, bless his, his gift this morning, the word that he's prepared for, you, uh, for us to receive from you today and open our hearts and our minds to receive in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you for the invitation to come and share with you. Um, I know a number of you, so it's good to come and be with you. I'm just going to put this out of the way, otherwise I'm going to knock my head on it, I'm sure. I'm only dinky. So, just as um, everyone's taken their seats from the worship team, there's some music playing, and I want to see if anyone of you can work out what it is. If you know what it is, put your hand up or shout it out. If you know that song, All I Ask of You, it's from the Phantom of the Opera. And in this song, the lyrics simply say, love me, that's all I ask of you. Sounds a nice, simple request, doesn't it? Just love me, that's all I ask of you. But I wonder, in those characters, as they sing that one to another, I wonder what they mean, what they're really requesting from each other. The reality is, in our relationships with each other, we will have spoken and unspoken expectations, maybe a rule of requirements, set requirements, so things that are important to us, so important in our relationship one to another. Think of those that you, you live with, those you love, those you work with, those you maybe serve alongside. I wonder what they would ask of you, and in fact, do ask of us. More broadly as a church, I wonder what do people ask of us? Do you think that people have expectations on us because, well, we're the church, because you're a Christian? Have you ever had it said to you that, well, if you're a Christian, you would act like this, you would behave like this, you would say like this, you would not do that? Well, that might be true. But it's interesting, I find, certainly, that there can be a projection from those outside of our faith, outside of our church community, as to what our faith community should be, what we should look like, what we should do, what we should be. And the truth is, we as humanity have wrestled with this question about what is asked of us, what is required of us. And when we look to scripture, I guess there are a number of places that we could turn to to find some direction on this. In the New Testament, we find Jesus is asked, what's the greatest commandment? And he encourages those that ask a question and for us listening today to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. Others ask Jesus, what should I do to follow you? Often the response is to leave what you have. Maybe not the answer that they wanted, but there we go. Some did leave their nets, they left their jobs, they left their tax booths to follow Jesus. But for others, the thought of giving up all that they have and had was just too great. In scripture we find time and time again that the people of God have a desire to be connected to him. They want to be forgiven. They want to know then what they need to do to receive this. 
Throughout the Old Testament and into the New Covenant with Jesus, we see the people of God focusing on religious acts and the following of commandments. However, we see increasingly the reminder and instruction from God that he would rather have obedience over ritual, over sacrifices. That he would desire our hearts and our character above potentially empty religious practice. Now, if you think back to a big interruption that happened just in recent years, you might remember it was something called the pandemic. Um, In some ways, it seems quite a long time since our doors were closed for probably around 18 months. It seems really weird to even think that that happened. But during that time, and I think particularly in those early months, um, it forced us within the church to kind of ask some deep questions. What is it that makes us church? What is it that makes me a Christian? I believe many reflected on these questions, asking themselves, well, if I can't go to that building at that time and do those things, how on earth do I live out my faith? The pandemic highlighted that for many of us, I would say particularly in the Western world, our expression of faith, of faith, our expression of Christianity, what church looks like could be summed up in the form of what happens in an hour or two on a Sunday morning. So when we couldn't gather in that old age, age old way, when we couldn't do things the way that we thought that we had to do them in terms of practicing our faith, the form of our gathering, it kind of stirred something within us. For some, our very faith was challenged. For some, it realized uh, that it led us to realize that maybe our faith isn't as rooted in what we thought it would be because it's only rooted in that practice and that form of going to church. And sadly for some, that that stirring has led them to even kind of disregard God and and not return through our church doors again. However, I do believe that for many of us, it helped us to reevaluate what our faith is rooted in and what the Lord does require of us. And so we return to that question then, what does the Lord require us? What is it all I ask of you? Well, there are many different ways that we find answers to this question in Scripture. Now, it might be that we are led and have a passion for different elements of our Christian faith and how we live that out. And that might, in turn, lead us to particular Scriptures. For example, if you've got a passion for evangelism, then you'll be so focused on the Great Commission found in Matthew 28 that you'll be, that's where you want to reside, that's where you want to sit, that's where you'll be telling everybody, this is how we live out our faith. We go and make disciples. Or your main focus might be just being in the presence of God and worship him and finding the verses of the Psalms, just that place to reside, that place to go to, that place of power, that place that forms your relationship with God. You may think that God wants holiness. That's the most important place to be. That's the most important ask that he has. And so the Ten Commandments define what God expects of you. Or you may want to emphasize the character of the Christian and so the fruit of the spirit that Paul describes might be your favorite. Well, today we're not going to look at all of those in depth, you'll be glad to know. Um, We do on our lunch at some point, but we're going to look at a verse found in the Old Testament. Near the end of the Old Testament, one of the minor prophets, this didn't mean that he went underground, it just meant that he was quite sure in his book. Uh, So um, Micah 6 verse 8 says, O people, The Lord has already told you what is good and what he requires of you. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. There you go. That's all you need to know, isn't it? So, now, we'll go a bit deeper. Sorry. (laughs) Now, we need to understand when the prophet was, uh, uh, Michael was around. Uh, So he ministered really against a bleak time in Israel's history. There was a mighty enemy, the Assyrian Empire. They'd arisen against Israel and Judah and succeeded in destroying the northern tribes of Israel. All this left the people of God scared, afraid of the future. How could they find security? Had God abandoned them? And if so, what do they need to do in order to make God happy with them again? Well, against this background, Micah speaks simple and plain truth. Because there was a recognition that the people of God were not living in a way that reflected the character of God. 
And so Micah says that God had already revealed exactly what his people needed to do and what he wanted from his people. We cannot hope to appease God by working our way into righteousness or to sacrificing others for our sin. Instead, Micah listed those three things, those three principles of doing justice, loving kindness and mercy and walking humbly with him. These are not necessarily about place and practice, but they're about character and presence, reflecting who God is. And the danger is today that we might still think that to earn God's acceptance, we have to work harder, try harder, uh, pray more. We need to do the practical things in order to earn his acceptance, to earn his forgiveness. And as we had prayed so powerfully, that forgiveness has been uh, received and given for us through Jesus on the cross. Because Micah and the other prophets constantly highlight the fact that simple offerings and going through rituals is not what God wants. He wants our hearts. He wants our hearts. And to try to earn our, uh, earn God's heart, to earn his grace, to earn his love, is not going to happen through pra- just going through the motions, religious practice. None of us are going to be perfect as we might project God's expectation upon us. As Paul says, all of us, have fallen short of the glory of God. But we are encouraged. We are encouraged to come into his presence as we are and to receive from him. When we look at the early church and those commentating on this early church, they looked at them and said, not, oh, look what they do when they gather. Look at the practice they do. Oh, I wonder if that's the right thing to do. They looked at them and said, see how they love one another. They looked at their character. They looked at how they lived amongst each other. Even the name Christian was given by those outside of the church community because Christian effectively means little Christs. And they were dubbed that because there they were, seeking to reflect the glory and the presence of Jesus. We're unable to do this in our own strength. Paul writes in Ephesians 2 that God saved you by his grace when you believed and you cannot take the credit for this. It's a gift from God. So returning to Micah, his words show us that to please God is not about simple sacrifices or a form of church tradition. And in this week of Christian unity that we've just been going through, there's a real, uh, you know, a real um, awareness and joy in the diversity of our church across the board it's not one size fits all but it's one God fits all it's not about the form and the practice it's about who we gather to worship who we come before so let's look at these three words briefly these three statements firstly to act justly now I've got here uh, you might have seen one you might have one uh, there's all different translations of the bible this one is called the poverty and justice bible and in it is highlighted all the times when there's anything to do with poverty and justice and in here there are over 2,000 references to justice to poverty and uh, to the poor so I'd kind of guess that God's got you know quite a big emphasis on this whole area of justice And so when Micah speaks, it shouldn't really be a surprise to the people who hear that God is calling the people to act justly. And acting justly is a way that we treat people in an even-handed manner, without favoritism, without prejudice or self-interest. In Zechariah 7 verse 9, it says, God says this, execute true justice, show mercy and compassion to everyone. Proverbs 21.3 says to do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. And Amos 5.24, let justice run like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. When we jump to the New Testament, we find Jesus putting an emphasis on justice. And this is different from getting revenge. It's above this whole idea of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But it's about the justice of God. Throughout the Gospels and in Paul's writings, we see instructions to turn the other cheek, to walk the extra mile, to not avenge those who have wronged us. And so for this passage, Micah helps us to focus on the character of God's people acting justly. 
For example, then today, if we're in a position where we might have a say over the pay of our employees, that might be in the news, we're not too sure, but we might ask the question, if we've got that role, are we paying justly? Do we treat our workers and employees justly? For those of us who work, do we work as if working for the Lord, as a good and just employee? When we're around in our community, do we respond to the needs and voices of our community with just ears, with ears of justice, or with judgmental ears? Do we seek to look after God's creation in a right and just way? As a church, how do we deal with conflict and resolution within our body? How do we demonstrate God's character of justice in these circumstances and more? So Micah encourages us not to merely appreciate justice, not simply agree that it's a good idea, but we're to do and act justly. Our actions reflect our beliefs. God wants his people to reflect his character. He's a just God. And so his people are to bring about justice in their communities. We're to seek out and support the broken, liberate the oppressed, deliver the downtrodden. We are to act justly. Okay, I want you to turn to the people next, person next to you. Put your hands out like this. Put them together. And just... Now, some of you have given me the, 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 uh, the look already. Now, if I was to say go, then we might have some cries of pain. We might have some pleading. We might have people on the floor. Do we know what game I might have asked you to play just then? Anybody? Mercy. Basically, you're, the idea of the game which we're not going to play, because that wouldn't be really very nice, is to bend back the, person's, the other person's fingers until they cry, Mercy! In which, at which time you are to stop. So don't do that, please. But we are required, says Micah, to love mercy. Not that game. Not love breaking people's fingers. We are required to love mercy. We're encouraged to be kind and compassionate. But it's not always easy to do so, is that? Would you say that's the case? It certainly is for me. But when, when we are merciful, it should lead us to having a, a naturally forgiving attitude towards other, others. Micah instructs us to love mercy, which leads us to wholehearted commitment to living in that way. Because even a selfish person wants to receive mercy, but someone who loves mercy is thankful for the mercy that God extends to them and wants to pass it on to others. God wants us to be merciful, motivated by our love for mercy. As part of the Sermon on the Mount, we find in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says that blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. James chapter 2 says that Uh, for judgment is without mercy to the one who is shown no mercy mercy triumphs over judgment and so Micah directs us to love mercy in a way that demands that we live charitably we speak peaceably and we serve others passionately like justice like the justice that God looks for Love and mercy needs to be rooted deep in our character because I don't believe that we can be merciful unless we receive that mercy from God. Not naturally, anyway. So in doing so, love and mercy becomes part of the natural posture of who we are, the character of who we are. Not something that we simply feel we must try to do to satisfy God, but something that just comes naturally to us after we receive and recognize the mercy God gives us. So we're to act justly, we're to love mercy. And now we're gonna think about walking humbly before our God. Now, Jamie, I wonder if you, I, I need, just need a couple of people. Um, one might be quite tall and one might be quite short. So if you're able to find maybe the shortest and the tallest people in the room, you get the blame, yeah, yeah, it goes that way, doesn't it? Because I can run away after this. And then if you want to just come out the front, if you've been selected by, uh, by Jamie. Like, like, like that. 
And all I need to do, if you just, if you just stand on that white line, look, facing across to Jamie, please, that'd be great. Okay, if you just want to stand, uh, stand here. So, what, what are your names? Chris and Mike. Okay, so there's a little bit of a height disparity here. What I want you to do is I want you to walk with purpose from one side to the other. Okay, three, two, one, go. With purpose. Okay, now I want you to walk as if you've just seen the bus you're going to get, and uh, if you don't walk with a bit more purpose than that, you might not get it. Okay, go. I think there could be a little bit more purpose in this. So if you don't get that bus, you won't get to the uh, won't get to the um, fast no the fast food shop to get the, before it closes, and you won't have any food, and you're absolutely starving. One, two, three, go. Oh, look at that, they're running, they're running, they're running. Well done, well done. You can now take your seat. Sorry, there's no prize, there's no sweets, but um, well done. When I was at uh, university, I, th I think I remember, um, I shared a house with a few people, and one of uh, the guys was on my, the course that I did. And he was in every lesson with me for four years uh, in our PE and geography and our teaching degree. And uh, the problem was uh, we had to walk everywhere. And this wasn't too bad. Since we did a P degree, we can't really moan that we had to do some exercise. Uh, but anyway, he was six foot four. I'm not. Have you ever tried walking some, with, alongside somebody with longer legs than you? you do, with long legs, have you ever tried to walk with somebody who's not got quite as long legs from you? Now, I'm at a little bit of an advantage here because my... my Little brother is not little, he's six foot eight. And so I've always had a long-legged member of fam my family to walk with. However, what was interesting through those university years is that when we started walking to our, our lessons, uh, Del and I would walk, and I'd probably have to kind of do a little, you know, run to keep up. My pace had to go quicker to get uh, up to speed with him. But we were walking together every day to every lesson, five days a week. And so over time, without thinking, we managed to match our pace. He slowed down or shortened his pace, and I managed to go that bit further on each of my strides. Without thinking about it, just by constantly being together, we were able to match our pace. It wasn't a chore for him to say, come on, catch up, and I didn't feel like I was running behind him like a little jockey. We matched our pace as we spent time walking together. Throughout the Bible, we see people who are highlighted as walking with God. Adam walked with God. Enoch walked with God. Noah, he was a just man. And do you know what? He walked with God. Proverbs verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. We humbly walk with God when we trust his guidance, because he knows the better way that we should go, much better than us. Now, humility is a strange thing. Before I was a Christian, I had the worldview that Christians were weak, doormats even, well, because you turn the other cheek and you, you're always kind and compassionate and nice. And that kindness and humility, in my eyes, before I found faith, I saw as a weakness. Because this sat against a world that promotes self, promotes importance, promotes power, authority, influence. That's the goals for us. Today you can earn thousands of pounds by being an influencer potentially having power and authority over others. However, in my experience since becoming a Christian, to walk humbly before God, I've realized, actually takes strength, <laughs> takes an intentional choice on my behalf. To walk humbly with God is it's not like I'm cowering in his presence, but I'm walking alongside him. 
I walk humbly before God because I realize I'm not God. We walk humbly because we need God and his direction. We walk humbly as it reflects the character of Jesus, who is obedient to God, even to death, as we read in Philippians 2. In my life, I've had to learn that to walk humbly before God means that I don't just simply lay out my plans and ask God to bless them, please. Thank you very much. I've worked out what I need to do. If you could just rubber stamp it, that'd be perfect. Instead, I desire to hear his plans and then seek to follow in obedience. At times, I've needed to hear God's voice to encourage me to raise my pace, to catch up with him and trust him more in the way that he is leading. At other times, I've needed to slow my pace to God's pace as I'm trying to run ahead in my own strength and in my own direction. And when I do that, when I reflect, it's those times when I'm trying to seek approval from others or trying to gain status or recognition for myself. And as Micah concludes this short statement of the Lord's requirements of us, we're reminded that God is in heaven and we are here on earth. We do not live and exist solely for our own glory, but rather we live to glorify God and enjoy him forever. We need to humbly understand that we are not the center of the universe, but we have the tremendous opportunity to share about the one who is the creator of the universe. So today, as we reflect on this just one verse, how is your faith experienced and expressed? Is your identity of faith focused on what you do or on who you are? Micah 6 eight reminds us that God requires us to be more focused on our heart and our character. Our practice is important, we're not saying that, but it needs to come as a result of our character, the result of who we are. And therefore, if we have a just character, then our natural instinct will be to recognize the need for justice around us. If we have a heart that loves mercy, then we celebrate the mercy we receive from God and seek to live a merciful life, really without thinking about it. It just comes naturally. And finally, when we recognize that God is God and he has his best plan for us, then we can demonstrate humility before God and honor him in all that we do. We are people who should do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before God. By focusing on these aspects, we see principles that will enable us to live faithful and fruitful lives for God. And we will shine our light on who God is and the character of who he is. So for those outside of our faith community looking in, they don't see form and practice and strange things that we do when we gather in this place. We see people who reflect the true character of God and his son Jesus. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for your heart for us. We thank you that you love us so much that you want to be in relationship with you. With you. Father, we thank you that you know us deeply and you call us into your presence. Father, forgive us for the times when we've tried to put ourselves at the center, when we've thought it's all about us, when we thought that we do it the best way and the proper way. And Father, today may we draw close to you again. May we have our ears and our hearts open to what you require of us. For some today, Father, we might need to just be reminded that you are a just God. May we reflect your justice. For others, Father, we might need to just be reminded of your deep, deep mercy for us. As we receive that, may we live that out by loving mercy. And for others... You may be calling us today to humble ourselves that you might increase and we might decrease so that we raise up your name and reflect your character in all we do. 
Amen. 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 Thank you, Matt. Wasn't that a brilliant word? So much to chew and think on. Thanks, Matt. Always welcome. Fantastic. And this is in this uh, final time of worship, let's sing a song together. This is about fanning into flame that gift. It's about asking God to take us further. And I don't know which of those particular aspects, or maybe all of those aspects, uh, are stuff that have really taken your attention today. But whatever it might be, let's ask God to fan that into flame, to show us the practical steps to help us take it forward and to live out that life to act justly, to do justice, to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. Let's ask for more of Holy Spirit guidance in this. More of Holy Spirit power, more of Holy Spirit life. There must be more than this Oh breath of God come breathe within There must be more than this Spirit of God we wait for you Fill us in you
Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way with us. Yes, Lord, fill us anew. Fill this church, the Shore Church, anew, Lord. Let your glory fall here. And we pray that for all of our brother and sister churches across this town, Lord. Let your glory fall. Fill us anew. We pray for Matt and Sarah and the Salvation Army. We pray for all the churches across our town. Let your glory fall in this place, the place of Bognor Aegis. Let us, let us be filled anew with your presence, Lord. Give us the words, Lord. Give us the power. Give us the insight. Lord, go before us and give us the wisdom and the humility and the courage and the imagination and the joy to walk with you. Lord, let this be a place where you have your way, where you show your way, where we follow you, the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ. Accept no substitutes. Lord, have your way. God bless you. Amen.